Dear parents, keep children at home at all times. Avoid sending children to shops and markets. Do not engage children in petty trading on the streets and garages. Allow children to play within the confines of the home. Limit visitors into your homes. Adhere to COVID-19 health precautions and guidelines. Schools are closed, but learning continues. Dear teachers, you are encouraged to desist from all forms of group activities involving students. All school premises should remain closed and not to be used for any other purpose. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Today we'll be looking at health and hygiene for the upper basic school. Uh, so we'll look at the definition of hygiene and also we'll look at the definition of um, health. So what is um, health? But before we get to that, uh, let me just um, inform you about the units we'll be looking at. Uh, we have community health and uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, let's move on. Our objectives are uh, include uh, with looking at it this way. By the end of this unit, we should be able to appreciate the importance of hygiene in the prevention of communicable and non-communicable diseases, demonstrate the ways of preventing community health problems. Health, as we can see, health of an individual is not just the absence of disease, but it also refers to his or her complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Everything must be complete. Hygiene, on the other hand, can be defined as the science and practice of maintaining good health. If you take a look at the pictures at the bottom there, uh, washing our hands, drinking uh, clean, safe water, brushing our teeth, combing our hair, and all the things that will help to uh, maintain good health is what we refer to as hygiene. In grade 7, you will recall we learned about personal cleanliness, the importance of keeping the body clean, ways of keeping the body clean, exercise and rest, eating right or eating the right kinds of food. Uh, all of these are very important. And uh, so here is a quick question for you. The most important reason for keeping the fingernails short and clean is to prevent the... So we have options there. A... It, to prevent the introduction of uh, germs into the body through the skin of the fingers, introduction of germs into the body through the mouth, cutting of one's skin accidentally, inflicting of injury on others. I'll give you a few seconds to ponder on that. Uh, what do you think was your right answer? Um, if we go through... The most important reason for keeping the fingernails short and clean is to prevent the introduction of germs into the body through the mouth. In grade 8, we learned about sanitation, which is simply about providing clean, safe drinking water and keeping the environment clean and tidy. Uh, types of waste, we also looked at solid waste, uh, liquid waste, airborne waste. We also looked at the effects of uh, this waste on our health and on the environment. Uh, we also looked at methods of uh, waste disposal. Good health is important in keeping us alive and fit to carry out our daily activities properly. So therefore in this unit uh, we will study community health problems 
and the ways of solving these problems. Personal health refers to the health at the individual level, the health of one individual, whereas community health refers to the health at a larger society. We're looking at everybody's health in the community. So another question for you, it is the individuals living together that make up community. Is that true or false? All right, three seconds to think about your answer. Yes, that is true. If we go to the next slide, you will see, as a matter of fact, it is our individual attitudes, our behaviors and actions that add up to influence the general health of the society. So everybody's individual head put together influences that of the society. And likewise, the society influences the health of every individual. And next, uh, we are going to look at um, major features of uh, community health, which include provision of adequate supply of safe drinking water, proper disposal of sewage and waste, protection from harmful drugs and unsafe food, control of vectors of diseases, control of pests, air hygiene and prevention of air pollution, elimination of other hazards, noise and radiation. We're going to look at each of these later on in detail. So some terms that are very, very important for us to look at in describing uh, outbreak of diseases, endemic, epidemic, pandemic, and sporadic. So think about it and uh, which ones you've heard of and which ones you already know. Because when we go to the next slide, um, I'll want to see how much we remember from those terms. So we will gradually start from the top to look at each one. Okay, so we can see endemic simply is referring to disease that is you know, prevalent in a community, in an area. It is already present in a community for quite some time. Malaria, as we know, has been with us for generations. So malaria is endemic. Epidemic is when we have large cases of uh, diseases you know, in, with a sudden outbreak. It's occurring just suddenly in one locality. A common example for that is cholera. A pandemic is when large areas, including several countries, are affected by a disease at the same time. A example is the very popular coronavirus. And uh, sporadic simply means the disease comes and then after some time it disappears. Uh, common cold is a typical example of that one. So let us move on. So here is a simple question. The outbreak of cholera in a large part of Senegal is an example of, so we have endemic, epidemic, pandemic, and sporadic. Okay, which one was your choice? Since it's only in Senegal, but it was a sudden outbreak, it's not something that is there all the time. So we'll refer to it as an epidemic. So it's an epidemic disease. Okay, the novel coronavirus, aka COVID-19, is an example of A or an, which of the options there? The right answer there should be, you get it right, should be pandemic, because it's now in several countries. Uh, next. Which of the following diseases can be described as sporadic? Remember the definition, sporadic? Is it Ebola, malaria, common cold, or AIDS? If you choose common cold, you are very correct. So, we see that many of the, these diseases are caused by tiny organisms that we call microbes, or simply microorganisms. Uh, we have thousands of these that are found uh, everywhere inside our body, outside our body, in the environment, find them in the homes, workplaces, marketplaces, garages, and so on. And when these organisms get into our bodies, through breathing, eating, or through cuts in the skin, they make us 
in. And uh, therefore, although this disease-causing disease organisms are found around us, certain conditions in our environment are favorable for their growth and spread. So our task here is to identify those favorable conditions that we create, not by design, but just by ignorance or our carelessness in some instances. And uh, what ways can we control or combat those situations so that we don't have uh, problems of health? So each community <coughs> has its own specific health problems. And some of these may be temporary. It's not there all the time. However, there are some health problems that are both epidemic and endemic. I hope you still recall the definitions. Um, epidemic, we said it is sudden outbreak just within one locality. But then uh, endemic, which means it's there all the time. You know, like I said, malaria is an, is an example. Our great-grandparents, they met it. We also are inheriting malaria. Now, why is it both epidemic and endemic? It is epidemic in the sense because it is widespread. And it is endemic because it's there all the time. So what are health problems? Let us look at our health problems. <clears throat> One is unhygienic waste disposal. So here we have health problems. So among them, very important, is unhygienic disposal of waste. Unhygienic waste disposal. Very important. Uh, it involves all the, um, our actions of just throwing you know, rubbish anywhere we feel like. If you can see in the picture, you know, people will just go because uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get rid of your rubbish. So people will just dump them anywhere. Um, that can be a very serious situation because um, they create room for microbes. That is those organisms that will cause disease in us to you know, be growing to have somewhere to reproduce themselves in large numbers. So that is a serious problem. Also, you recall, talking about unhygienic waste disposal, uh, in Great, we mentioned about some of this waste um, that we have or that we produce uh, from our kitchen and from other domestic you know, environment. Uh, we have a lot of waste from burning wood, uh, the remains of vegetables, and um, plastic, papers, and all these things that we use to wrap our food and other things. At the end of the day, we throw them. Um, excretory waste, that is feces and the urine that uh, comes from our homes. And the uh, bathroom or from laundry. You know, when we do these things, we have waste that are being produced from these things. So all these types of waste need to be disposed of properly. <clears throat> So there are uh, some thoughts for us to look at. In which, ways are they in which ways are they disposed of in your community? Uh, can you think of specific problems associated with the way in which um, these waste are disposed of in your community? As you must have learned, in most communities, household refuse stored in a variety of uh, containers such as buckets, or sometimes we have some of these uh, bags that... Uh, empty rice bags, we can use them to store our waste. We have pans, we have cartoons, uh, we have other disposable things. Um, also, we may collect this in large amounts and then cleansing service, uh, example from the KMC or from the BCC or from Brikama Area Council will come and then they collect these things and take them to the dump site. Uh, they usually result in a situation wherein if these people don't come and collect this waste, uh, this waste accumulates in huge amount and then they become very uh, disturbing in the environment. So uh, these refuse also are collected at marketplaces, garages, and just where people you know, gather. We always have waste that uh, we live in there. So when these are uh, 
unattended to. When they are not collected in such areas, they accumulate in a large amount, and that becomes a problem for us. <clears throat> so the health problems associated with improper solid refuse disposal. So now, uh, what are the problems we encounter here when we don't dispose of our refuse, the solid waste, uh, liquid waste, airborne waste, and so on? What are the problems we get? One is that it encourages vectors to breed, encourages vector breeding. In a moment, we'll be talking about the meaning of the term vector, if you already don't know it. Uh, in the, during the rainy season, uh, you have empty tins and cans among refuse heaps and those that we throw, you know, without even thinking about them. So here we're looking at vector, simply mean the organism that is carrying the, the things that cause disease. If you look at the picture, uh, the organisms you are seeing there, these are vectors. They carry the organisms that cause disease. And uh, so well, among them, you have like the mosquito, which will also breed very well. We all know about this, and um, oh, we feel the consequence when mosquitoes breed in large amount, and then they create malaria for us. Also, we have um, excretory waste disposal, excretory waste disposal as a problem. All right, it's a serious public health concern in both urban and rural areas. Still, we are looking at health problems. So later, we'll have to look at what do we do to control or to manage these health problems. So one we're looking at here now, excretory waste disposals, what problems we have there, one of the most common ways our people get rid of waste is to have pit latrines that are open. So we have open pit latrines. In some other places, they have buckets, or they call them pale latrines. I'm not quite sure this is still going on, but it used to be common, especially in some areas where in buckets are used for collection of uh, feces. And uh, we also have uh, unsanitary waste disposal. Unsanitary waste disposal, uh, often in the form of the liquid water that comes from either the bathroom or from washing clothes and so on. And these things just run into open gutters. And of course, you can see how one problem leads to another. Because when these things go into the gutters and the gutters... Um, they all meet at some place, so you have a large amount of water settling. Of course, like we mentioned before, it helps mosquitoes to breed. So these are all some of the health concerns that uh, we have there. And the sale of unhygienic food is another major problem that we would want to look at. So remember, first we're looking at how do we let me just put those points here. Waste disposal is one is the first problem we're looking at. Next, we're looking at a sale of food. And in this case, we're looking at food stuff <coughs> that um, is sold in unhygienic condition. Um, a lot of the time, you are in the street, or you're passing somewhere, you're hungry, you want food, so you look for these uh, food hawkers or food vendors, and there you buy food. But uh, in some instances, um, the food, the handling of the food might be a problem, or the environment where the food is sold, or the containers in which the food is sold could be a huge problem. So uh, what do we do in that instance? We come to number three. Uh, now we're looking at unsafe drinking water as another health problem. So if we expose ourselves to drinking water that is unhygienic, water that is not clean, and uh, you drink these things, of course, you are simply 
taking in um, things that are going to cause disease in your body, and uh, that can be a serious problem. You would also see <coughs> uh, children particularly, often you see them going into some of this dirty water. They don't know much about this hygiene, and um, uh, sometimes they even bathe in them, and they swim in this dirty water. So imagine a picture like this, a child swimming in water like this. That child is definitely going to uh, take in a lot of microbes. And that can result in a lot of uh, problems, okay? Um, they can expose themselves to diseases like cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, and a lot of diseases that affect the digestive system. And uh, sometimes, some people have this practice of when they are washing clothes, they will just throw the water, especially if they live near streams. So they just throw the dirty water into the stream. Some of us, we use the same stream for drinking, for bathing, and we collect the water and we do our cooking. Um, all of these can uh, be a source of collecting germs. And uh, once the water is contaminated, it becomes a serious problem. So <clears throat> other community health problems will uh, include overcrowded situations. Huh? We have poorly ventilated and overcrowded Poorly ventilated, ventilated. It's talking about ventilation, like creating um, or making your uh, houses such that enough air should be able to flow in. But if you are in overcrowded places, the flow of uh, air uh, becomes very poor, and uh, hence that is a very serious uh, concern for. <coughs> Uh, the people that are living there because they would have some health problems. Uh, one more we have is the fact that some people take up bad habits like cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking and sometimes uh, even very young children can take up uh, cigarette smoking and this is of course very bad. In the Gambia, we can see the government have put in place mechanism to ban public smoking. If you must smoke, you have to do it at your private location, no more in public places. But of course, these are some of the uh, major health problems that we encounter. So now that we have identified the problems, we said waste disposal is a serious problem. Sale of uh, foodstuff in unhygienic places is another major problem unsafe drinking water, uh, poorly ventilated or overcrowded houses, these are all problems. Uh, children taking up bad habits. Uh, so what can we do to solve this? I was even going to ask, uh, is there some other things or some other uh, actions we do that may be uh, placed under this group? Uh, maybe you want to say issues with alcohol drinking because uh, we have some young people who now take up uh, the habit of drinking alcohol, even at early age. And then they become addicted to this alcohol, and that can create some serious problems. Um, <clears throat> what do we do to handle these problems? So ways to solve the community problem. Uh, let us look at that. Ways to solve community problems. Remember earlier on we mentioned that the health of individuals contribute to the health of the community. And likewise, the health of the community influences or affects the health of individuals. So if we're solving uh, community problems, we are equally solving problem, uh, health problems for individuals. <clears throat> so one problem we have, I mean one solution is that household members should contribute uh, their own quota in keeping the um, environment healthy and clean. How do we do that? Um, we control the waste that we produce. Is it solid waste or is it the liquid waste that we produce or anything that is uh, coming from us that we don't want? Once they are controlled, then uh, that will make it uh, better for us to improve on our health and uh, number two, you can see community members should embark on regular cleansing exercises. Uh, in the Gambia here, set settle is very common. So first we'll say one, individuals 
uh, contribute. Uh, individuals, let's say, do their own bit, like clean your, <coughs> your houses, your environment, your compound. And uh, number two, we're saying you can come as little groups at community level. We can uh, do, you know, community, community cleansing, uh, cleanliness. Huh? You can come out on set set all day with your brooms and your buckets and uh, clean the environment, collect all this rubbish and uh, put them safe, uh, clean the gutters. Everywhere that we have rubbish that is going to disturb the environment, we keep all of them out of the place. You can see um, little children, okay? Uh, they're learning at a very early age how to clean the environment. You know, they are typical example of set settle. Everybody, you know, all hands on deck. And if we look at the subsequent pictures, okay, again, uh, we can see young people, the youth, uh, actively involved in uh, cleaning the environment. And of course, <clears throat> at the larger scale, um, the municipalities to do its own part in the streets and so on, so that people can have somewhere to put their rubbish. You know, sometimes it's not that people just want to keep the environment dirty, but sometimes you don't have where to dispose of your waste. So in creating this type of um, containers and uh, so on, it makes life easy for people. You have your rubbish. Now we need to inculcate the habit of, you know, when you have your rubbish and you don't have somewhere to dump it, keep it. Like you're in vehicles and so on. And once you reach one of these containers, then you can safely put them there. Uh, you can see photograph of uh, vehicles that, of course, when you have large amount of uh, rubbish, uh, the vehicle can come and pick up. So number three says... <clears throat> The practice of cleaning the environment on a regular basis is very, very important. But what is most important is for us to you know, train ourselves, discipline ourselves so that we don't make the environment dirty. If we don't make it dirty, there is no need to clean it. We need to clean because we make it dirty. Uh, some will be trying to make things neat and tidy while others don't care. You know, vehicles are passing, people just throw rubbish in the street. We have to train ourselves. And if you're sitting with somebody, perhaps you can gently remind that person, please, um, we should you know, keep the environment dirty. But be polite so you don't start to quarrel them. So everybody in the environment at every level um, in the community, you know, if we all stop throwing plastics, we you know, gather them, and um, we... The other waste we get from the homes, you know, when you peel fruits or you women cooking, they, you know, collect these things, uh, put them in containers, and when this vehicle come and they pick them up, that will help a lot in improving our health condition. We ourselves, you know, try not to litter your environment. That's very, very important. Try not to litter your environment. That will help a lot in keeping the place very clean. And uh, we go, number four. <coughs> so hopefully you've got these notes down. And uh, we go up to number four that says, public and household pit latrines and buckets uh, should not be near well. So um, keep all latrines away from kitchen. Let, they should not be near your kitchens because this is where you are preparing food. So if they're very close to your kitchens, that means, um, like we mentioned earlier, microbes can easily come from those areas and then come to your kitchen and then make problems for you. And number five is talking about food vendors. Now what should they do? <clears throat> Uh, these people should uh, keep their food items away from flies and dust. How can they do that? Simply, uh, if you have your food and they simply ask you to cover it with plastic, or sometimes uh, people will have um, boxes, transparent box if you like, and then 
you enclose the food there to protect the food so that germs and uh, microbes and other things will not go there. So it, it is also very important to screen people that deal with food, people who sell food. So if you, if somebody is going to sell food and that person is already having some diseases, there is every likelihood that the person will be passing on these diseases through the food to other people. So these are <clears throat> some of the ways we can handle uh, the problems of community health. And uh, it says again, another important aspect there is education, which we can participate in. Okay? Uh, if we give education to the larger community and to our you know, neighborhood and to our friends and family, uh, we tell them the importance um, of uh, keeping the environment healthy and clean, um, that will help a lot. You can see it says, uh, if people in a community do not know how diseases are spread or how they may be prevented, the standard health of the, health of the community will not improve. So uh, these were the few points I put around, and uh, we want you to mention other ways. Um, uh, see if you can mention other ways of maintaining a good health in your community. You can think, there, there should be more. I've just brought uh, like four or five points, so you can probably add some more there. Okay? <clears throat> so now we want to look at diseases caused by organisms what diseases that organisms cause. Because um, when we feel sick, it is because in some instances, uh, these diseases are caused by organisms. Uh, we have some important terms there, so let us take note of them. One of them is the word pathogen, or simply the organism that causes disease. So when these organisms are in your body, you are going to be sick. Symptoms. Sometimes we talk about signs and symptoms. Um, these are the things that tell us what, um, what we can look for to know somebody is having uh, a disease. So doctors can be able to tell some by you know, reading your temperature and they will be able to tell you have a fever. Uh, you may feel pain, you may feel headache. Uh, sometimes if you touch your skin, you can feel it's warm. That might give an indication that uh, you're having fever. But of course, uh, to know actually that uh, you are carrying certain diseases, there are some tests that have to be done. Uh, next, we're looking at the mode of transmission. Mode simply means uh, the means of passing on the disease. Transmission. Modes of transmission. How is this disease passed from one person to the other, or which, whichever way they are passed. Uh, vectors, I mentioned earlier on, these are the organisms that bring disease to our foods, to our bodies, to our waters, and so on. And there is what we call the host, the chief host, or the primary host. Host simply means, you know, you welcoming somebody, you housing somebody. So if you become a chief host for a disease, it means you are the person that the disease is going to cause a sickness in your body. Uh, that means uh, they pass through, which is the next term, secondary or intermediary host. They pass through some other organism in some instances before they can reach you. Parasites, probably not a new word. It simply means organisms that either live on your body or they live uh, inside your body they, to obtain food and of course they get a free lodging. But in addition to that, while they are getting food and lodging, they cause disease in your body. Uh, the next term we want to look at is what they call incubation period. Incubation period. This is simply <clears throat> the time it takes for the disease to from the moment the disease enters your body to the time symptoms are begin to show or the time you begin to feel sick. 
So sometimes you have the disease and you don't even know because you don't feel anything and nobody sees anything on you. But um, after a certain period, which we refer to as the incubation period, then the disease begins to manifest itself in you. And the final one is uh, what we refer to as the control. Uh, there are other nice terms there, prophylaxis and so on. These are all just to make things very nice. Uh, it simply means how do you control disease? How do you prevent it so that uh, you don't get more people having the disease? So, <clears throat> disease-causing organisms are carried by a what? Uh, this will help me know if you are really following my uh, descriptions here. Disease-causing organisms are carried by a, is it a protozoan, worm, parasite, or vector? So if you recall, when I explained vectors, we said they are the ones that carry disease-causing organisms. Uh, next, the period between infection and manifestation of the symptoms of a disease is known as, I think it was the second to last thing I spoke about. Um, if you choose incubation period, correct. So here we have some uh, pictures of Pathogens, remember what I said? Pathogens are the microorganisms that cause disease. So viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, worms, these are common pathogens. And they are the guys that are responsible for most of our discomfort. Viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, worms. Uh, you have, I have um, a good number of uh, pictures. First of all, you can see a collection of those very tiny ones. So, which of the following is or are pathogens? Is it flies? Is it mosquitoes? Is it cockroaches? Is it bacteria? Think carefully. Pathogen. What did we say are pathogen? We said these are organisms that cause disease. Does fly cause disease? Does mosquito cause disease? Does cockroach or cockroaches, do they cause disease? What about bacteria? Do they cause disease? So, the right answer there should be bacteria. The others, we'll put them under this group, the vectors. Viruses <coughs> cease to live when they are outside a living cell. Viruses, they cease to live when they are outside a living cell. Um, is this true or false? What do you think? Okay, I didn't tell you much about viruses, but the answer there is true. Viruses can only survive when they are inside living cells. When you take them outside living cells, they stop living. However, that does not mean if they now have access to other living things, they will, of course, start living again. Let's go. So uh, that's a picture of a bacterium cell. And here we have pictures of uh, different kinds of fungi. Mushroom, I believe, is very uh, popular. And uh, you can see in the ring there, that is what you will, that's what they look like when you look at them in the microscope. We have also more protozoans there. Um, Chlamydomonas is there, amoeba, paramecium, and of course, euglena. This is just to show you some samples of uh, protozoans. Let's move on. Worms are also responsible for the diseases that we uh, sometimes get. And that's a very sad picture of a boy. You can see worms coming out of the nose and the mouth. And of course, the giant ones are uh, on the right there, you can see. A tapeworm is there, a round worm, and so on. Um, which of the following is not a source of infection? Source of infection. Infection means getting disease. And usually it is done when organisms like flies and cockroaches and so on bring the disease onto you. So which of them is not a source of infection? Uh, we have air, water, droplet, and virus. So which of them would you say is not a source? Uh, think of it, virus is what? Virus itself is a pathogen because it causes disease. Now, air is a means by which the disease can be transmitted. So it's the same with water. And of course, droplets are when people sneeze and cough or when, even when they talk. Uh, you have droplets of saliva coming from their mouth and floating in the air. So 
we're going to look at types of diseases. Types of diseases. Okay? So first, there's this nice term, uh, epidemiology, which studies the outbreaks of diseases. And uh, next, which is very important for us, uh, it says diseases are either communicable or they are non-communicable. Uh, what do we mean? If they are communicable, it means they can be passed from person to person. Uh, if they are non-communicable, it means um, they are not caused by organisms, so they cannot be passed from person to person. So we have to take note of the differences. Um, again, note that communicable diseases, because they are caused by organisms, so once they can pass on those organisms on to, from a sick person to a healthy person, they'll have communicable diseases. Uh, Non-communicable because they are not caused by disease, so they cannot be passed from person to person. Um, so among the communicable diseases, we can uh, break them into two types. So we have one, contagious diseases. That means people need to come into contact with each other for the disease to be passed from person to person. And then you have the infectious type, which is the one that is caused by um, so the organism that causing, causes the disease, now the disease must pass through some other organism. Sometimes it doesn't cause disease there, but then when it comes to us, the humans, that's where it shows itself most. So you can see infectious diseases, they are spread by what we call intermediate or secondary hosts. Uh, example could be the insect, it could be water, it could be air. So there, let's take note of these two. Contagious disease, you can only get them when somebody that is having the disease passes it on to you. Whereas infectious disease, you get them either through the air, you know, breathing some the disease, the pathogens that the person breathes out, or <clears throat> insects like uh, mosquito, you know, taking the organism called plasmodium and then bringing it into your body, or even the water we drink. If you have... Uh, water that is infected, then you can have infectious diseases. So those are the two types of communicable disease. Let's move on. All right, so what must be there for communicable diseases to occur? It is very important that something has to be there. And what are these things that must be there? There must be a causative agent, okay? It must be an organism that is going to cause the disease. There must be a susceptible host, somebody in which the disease is going to show itself. And of course, there must be a transmission route. Like we said, it could be either by contact or contagious. Uh, it could be through the air. It could be through the water and foods we drink if they're infected. So once those three things are available, then the person can, I mean, disease can be communicable. If one of them is absent, it's not possible. Next, <clears throat> um, they could also be uh, communicable diseases can be airborne. So first of all, let's just look. We've said, um, we've looked at the way you can get them. So now we're looking at uh, which means, you know, we have the airborne diseases. That means you get them through the air. People, like I mentioned, people breathing, people coughing, even talking. Uh, some of these diseases can be passed from person to person. Uh, we have common cold, measles, whooping cough, poliomyelitis, or simply polio, tuberculosis, and meningitis. These are diseases that can be passed through the air. It doesn't mean they cannot be passed through other means as well, but um, some diseases are limited only to certain uh, means of uh, passing them on. Um, next, we look at Waterborne diseases, uh, water or food, water or foodborne diseases. Okay, they include dysentery, <coughs> cholera, typhoid fever. So it means we get these ones if the food we are going to eat or the liquids or water we are going to drink are contaminated with the germs, then we have them. 
You will notice that sometimes um, when people are preparing food, we have need to be careful sometimes at large gatherings uh, because sometimes we have many hands on deck. And uh, if the people are not careful in the way they handle the food and um, they bring in disease, uh, people can be infected. And the final one there is insect-borne diseases. Right, like malaria, which is um, passed on to us by the mosquito. Okay, the mosquito brings the disease, the pathogen that is causing the disease. Yellow fever. The WHO had, uh, you know, fought very tough battle with yellow fever. Um, by large extent, they've reduced it. But uh, sometimes it pops up a little bit and then disappear again. So these are the, uh, the ways that uh, diseases can be passed. Uh, we have worm infestation. So let me take number four right up there. I need this note. This is why I'm leaving them there. Worm infestations. Uh, you have a broad band of worms, uh, quite a large number of worms, but uh, I mentioned only roundworm, tapeworm, hookworm, and guinea worm, because these are very common in West Africa particularly. And uh, we also have animal, uh, animal born diseases, that is diseases that are passed to us through animals, okay? Uh, rabies is a very uh, popular one there. We get this from dogs. Rabies is actually caused by viruses. So the viruses are passed from uh, dogs onto us humans, and then we can have it there. And the final one is contact. So we have those diseases we get when we come into co direct contact uh, with people, uh, contact diseases. Among these, you have the sexually uh, transmitted diseases, and of course, <clears throat> they include gonorrhea, syphilis, and there are other diseases like uh, athlete's food, uh, which you can get if, you, if a member of the f uh, in the house, um, if, if a member of the family in the house is having athlete's food, uh, you're all using the same bathroom, and sometimes you wear each other's slippers and so on, uh, you can easily uh, pick up athlete's food. Of course, uh, some people are susceptible. Nous